It's our School of Social Sciences. And I want to welcome you to today's event, The Alarming Rise of White Supremacy and Nationalism, Its Roots and Remedies. It is an important subject and a vital one for us at the Colin Powell School and at CCNY. As Dean, I've always seen our work here as a political project. It's about educating students who come from communities that have historically lacked power to succeed in the professions and in public service so that they can take and they can use power and make progress for themselves, for their families, for their communities. And as an institution whose students are 80% people of color, what we do is in part an antidote to white supremacy. But white supremacy is far from defeated in the United States. We're very fortunate to have with us today a person who is not only immensely knowledgeable about its history and its potency, but someone who has been on the front lines of fighting it for the, du the duration of his career. Eric Ward is the executive director of the Western States Center. He is a nationally recognized expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, hate violence, and the preservation of an inclusive democracy. Western State Center has become a national hub for innovative responses to white supremacy, to white nationalism, to anti-Semitism and to structural inequality. And it's a hub for work that is focused on building a world where everyone can live, love, work, and worship free from bigotry and fear. In his more than 30 years as a civil rights leader, Eric has worked with community groups, government and business leaders, human rights advocates, and philanthropy as an organizer, a director, a program officer, a consultant, a board member. The occasion for today's event is the presentation of the 2021 Civil Courage Prize to Eric Ward later this week. The Civil Courage Prize honors the extraordinary few among us who resolutely pursue freedom for many, despite the consequences to themselves. And Eric is the first recipient from the United States to win this award. So congratulations, Eric, and we're grateful to have you with us today for this conversation. I want to thank um, Yusa Train Klebnikov, Barbara Becker, and everyone associated with the Civil Courage Prize for partnering with us on this event. Eric is gonna be in conversation with Colin Powell School Senior Fellow, Gara LaMarche. Gara was until recently the president of the Democracy Alliance. He has spent his career as a leader in progressive philanthropy and in social justice organizations. And he is now co-directing the launch of the new Center for Democracy and Social Justice here at CUNY and specifically based here at the Colin Powell School and at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. The center provides a training ground for early and mid-career social justice leaders nationally. Many of them are our students. And we had the meeting of the very first cohort of fellows just this past weekend. It was an inspiring experience. The fellows, again, many of whom are CCNY students, many of whom are CUNY students, they're also very much a part of this project of dismantling white supremacy. So this event is co-sponsored today by the Leadership Center, and we're glad to have Gara for the conversation. For today, the first portion of the conversation is going to be between Gara and Eric, then the chat is open and we'll have a question and answer period um, through the chat, but also potentially with opportunities for folks to ask their questions directly when we get to the latter part of the program. I also want to mention we're recording today's event. Thank you all very much for being here. And with that, let me turn it over to Gara. Thanks a lot, Andy. Uh, it's great to be here and to be in conversation with my friend, uh, Eric Ward. I've known Eric for a number of years. We were colleagues at the Atlantic Philanthropies and also more generally in philanthropy when he was at the Ford Foundation. And he has been a leader in anti-racist work for, for many, many years. Um, congratulations on the Civil Courage Prize and on being the first American recipient of it. And um, it's terrific to have this occasion for a conversation about some of the uh, alarming trends in the United States and the world that have led to this award. Um, so I want to start out, Eric, by saying that I understand that the Civil Courage Prize is a recognition uh, that you see it as a recognition for the work you lead at the center and not so much as an individual achievement. I get that. But it also recognizes the leadership that you've shown personally. And as somebody who teaches uh, a lot and has a lot of contact with young people and some of my students are you know, among the people on this call, 
Um, I know there's great interest in understanding the journeys that people like you have taken to the work that they're doing. So I'd love it if we could start by you sharing a little bit about your journey, where you're from, uh, what sparked the consciousness about social justice and equality that's been a through line for your entire career. Yara, thank you. And it is, uh, it is wonderful to be back with you and to, to be into, in conversation. Uh, it's, it's quite an honor to be a recipient of, of this award. The, the ceremony is, is, is Friday. Of course, it, it's open to the public. Uh, uh, it looks to be a wonderful program. But I'm excited to, to have this conversation today. It's been a long road uh, uh, through the urban streets and the uh, back roads of uh, right-wing violence in this country. And, and my story actually uh, doesn't start in the heart of, of white nationalism. It starts on the fringe. It, it starts as a young kid uh, who is a, uh, uh, a, both a recipient and a victim of racial desegregation of the public schools in Southern California, particularly in Long Beach in the 80s. Uh, I was bused to a school, uh, which sometimes meant riding the city bus. And when you rode the city bus, you were kind of let off about uh, four or six blocks away from the school and you had to walk the rest of the way. And uh, I and other students were the, the victims of uh, significant and ongoing uh, racial harassment, uh, racial intimidation. These weren't other students, right, in, in junior high school. And these were adults uh, on their way to and from school and college students on their way to and from uh, Cal State Long Beach, uh, Long Beach Community College. And, you know, they would shout the most vile things. They would, they would rev their engines. And uh, I changed schools in ninth grade and uh, still found myself uh, and others, the, the victim of that type of, of uh, hate intimidation. Now we were kids, right? And as you know, in middle school, in junior high school, the last thing you wanna do is stand out, right? Uh, unlike when you're an adult. And so uh, it was normalized so quickly. Uh, it's funny, I, I've talked to some of my friends who experienced that. And we reflect on not once did we think about telling our parents, not once did we tell uh, a teacher or any adult, uh, it was what it meant to go back and forth to school. You know, in ninth grade, uh, uh, there was a point uh, one day where I just decided uh, not to run. And uh, it was in that moment uh, that I decided that it was important uh, uh, to stand up against bigotry and not just for oneself, but for others. I grew up in the punk scene in Southern California and the punk scene ultimately uh, uh, was invaded by uh, uh, young folks who uh, had uh, white power analysis, wanted to spread uh, uh, racism and other forms of bigotry uh, in that music scene. And so ultimately, uh, we had to choose what to do. And drawing off that lesson of no bullies, uh, uh, no support from adults, we, we banded together and we did the, the best that we knew how to do. Uh, uh, in that moment. It wasn't until later, once I moved to, to Oregon from Southern California, that uh, I came to understand. And we'll wait. Sarah, you may want to mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, she did. <laughs> uh, but that's beautiful chimes. Uh, uh, they're gorgeous chimes. Um, but, at, you know, the, to cut the story short, Gara, you know, it was in that music scene and then moving up to Oregon that I began to meet others and to learn from others who, who really taught me uh, that we didn't need to uh, resort uh, to the, to the uh, violence of the white nationalist movement, that there were other ways that we could build an alternative by engaging in communities, by believing in people, uh, 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 education. And so that really was uh, uh, the start. And I moved up to Oregon at the same time as another individual. His name was uh, Richard Butler. He was a pastor. He moved up uh, a few years before me. He was a retired uh, 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 engineer at an aircraft company in Southern California. But Richard Butler was a white nationalist and uh, his church was called Church of Jesus Christ Christian Aryan Nations. And uh, they had a plan and it was to turn the Pacific Northwest into an Aryan homeland. Uh, that was free of Blacks and Jews. And I was really uh, lucky 
to be able to work with a broad coalition of individuals, activists, and organizations uh, across the country, across this region. Uh, and uh, we decided that we may not agree on everything, but we agreed that organized bigotry didn't have a place, that it wasn't a real solution to the complex problems and discussions we were having. So, well, we could have a whole another webinar about your music life, but um, yes. we'll, leave, <laughs> we'll leave that off to the side for, for a moment uh, in the punk scene and so on. But, um, well, that, it really segues nicely into the Western State Center work, and I want to talk a little bit or have the audience understand, if they don't already, a bit about Western States. You know, I think a lot of people... Um, uh, think of Oregon or have thought of Oregon over the years uh, and, and, and the Pacific Northwest as a very progressive place and in some respects politically it is and yet uh, it's also been a, quite a hotbed for a white supremacy and white nationalism. So tell me about the uh, founding, the origins of the Western State Center, how you came to it and what the day-to-day -day work of the Western State Center is. Yeah, so Western State Center is a 30-year-old uh, progressive social change uh, uh, institution based out of Portland, Oregon. It works in the uh, Pacific Northwest and inner mountain states uh, to, to engage in four areas of social change, right? To build leadership uh, and support leadership. The second is, is to uh, invest, right, energy, resources, and support. Uh, to campaigns, and uh, the third is to uh, continue to strengthen our storytelling, right, our narratives, uh, how we talk about uh, uh, this region and the country, and the fourth is, is to help our civil uh, institutions, civil society, uh, respond to uh, movements that are grounded in anti-democracy, Right? Uh, uh, we build around those four areas, leadership development, organizational capacity, narrative, and uh, defending civil society in order to advance gender and, and racial equity. Uh, we believe that uh, gender and racial equity strengthen democracy and that democracy is still one of the most radical ideologies uh, to ever be practiced. The, the idea right, that people can uh, inherently uh, decide who represents them and decide on their own the best course of action to, to address both challenges and opportunities. We don't need kings or queens. Uh, uh, we don't need uh, uh, the elite, right? That everyday people uh, have the power and the ability to, to govern their own affairs. And uh, Western State Center fundamentally is an organization that is committed to defending uh, democracy and, and the practice of, of democracy. That's Western states. And you're right, we are based here in Portland, Oregon, uh, uh, despite the uh, uh, amazing comedy that is Portlandia, right? Portland and Oregon have a much more complex uh, history. Uh, it is uh, fair to say that Oregon uh, is one of the first white nationalist uh, states. And I'll, and I'll get into a little bit later, Kara, maybe we can talk a little bit about what I mean there. Uh, but, but in short, Oregon, uh, when it entered the Union, entered as a uh, anti-slavery state, meaning that slavery was outlawed in the state of Oregon. Now that might sound progressive like many of Oregon's progressive policies, but the truth is, is that Oregon decided to be a free state, not a slave state, because it didn't want black people to reside within the state territories at all. Uh, the original constitution uh, forbade uh, uh, black people from residing in the state and most of the black population doesn't uh, exist in Oregon uh, until World War II. Uh, uh, some other tidbits, Gara, uh, Oregon had the largest clan west of the Mississippi in the 1920s and, and 30s. And even today, that legacy of anti-Black racism, uh, discrimination, uh, uh, and uh, racism towards Indigenous people uh, still very much exists. Here in Portland, Oregon, where I live, uh, uh, Black people are, are less uh, uh, than 6%, probably somewhere around 4% of the Portland population yet. Uh, uh, black folks are three times more likely uh, to be stopped by police 
and four times more likely uh, to be killed by uh, law enforcement. By most data, uh, national data, uh, the Portland Police Bureau is one of the uh, most brutally racist uh, law enforcement agencies uh, uh, in the country, uh, despite the fact that there is very little black population. It is, uh, uh, that is not unique uh, uh, to the police bureau. When you look at most of the data here, uh, uh, where a black score in terms of livability makes it a hard uh, a place to live and often uh, uh, not called Portlandia, uh, many black folks uh, who uh, uh, have been here in Oregon for a long time, often referred to Oregon has up south or Northwest Mississippi. The only difference being that we don't have anywhere near the black population that Mississippi has. Mississippi with better artisanal coffee. With uh, better coffee and, and uh, a very popular TV series. Right. So you made a reference to this a little bit ago and I wanna kind of uh, probe it a little bit more because we use both uh, the terms white supremacy and white nationalism in the uh, kind of promotional materials for this talk. And if there's any silver lining for the dire times that we live in, it's that anybody who's paying even a little bit of attention, you know, realizes that white supremacy and white nationalism are real, continuing, and serious. So it's, it's certainly not possible to, for anybody uh, to have their head in the sand about that anymore. Now, you use both of those terms, and I wonder if you could unpack them a little bit for us. Yeah, so at Western State Center, we, we do distinguish between uh, uh, the terms, but, but not in a hierarchical way. Uh, we believe we're in a moment that calls on us to confront both the uh, legacy and the present day uh, uh, outcomes of white supremacy, right, and contend with and, and manage this white nationalist back, uh, backlash. Uh, I'll back up a little bit because uh, I think it's uh, a fair question, right? Is white supremacy and white nationalism uh, uh, different from one another? And, and here's how I would explain it, at least from Western State Center's uh, uh, lens. White supremacy is a historic and present day system of inequality and discrimination and social control. It was founded on the, the basis of white superiority, right? The belief that white skin uh, uh, made one fully human and not having white skin made one less than human. Uh, it was that ideology of uh, white superiority that was used, right? To, to ultimately help organize and socialize a society into what became the United States of America. It was grounded upon uh, uh, three specific actions, right? Nothing is neutral. Everything uh, uh, has a result. And, and the three results of, of white superiority or white supremacy, right, was the stolen land and genocide of native people. Right, a, a system of, of chattel slavery, a, a unique, brutal form of, of chattel slavery that enslaved uh, 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 human beings who came from the continent of Africa, right, and stripped them of their language, their their culture, right, their religion, uh, basically deconstructed human beings, right, and uh, uh, then uh, through a system uh, called chattel slavery reconstructed them uh, into something else, not without resistance, but that was the uh, effect of chattel slavery. The third that we often don't talk about, Gera, um, though uh, uh, when you and I worked together, uh, uh, I think it was a conversation that was really central to the conversation of race, was uh, gender and sexuality, right? The control of women, and the control of sexuality in society. It was those three pillars, uh, the genocide, the chattel slavery, the control of sexuality that allowed the United States to construct into a very uh, prosperous and, and powerful society. That was white supremacy and it was uncontested, uh, not unresisted, but uncontested is the primary lens upon which all of us, right, saw and understood society. Then along in the 1960s, and not really in the 1960s, but that's a historical marker, uh, along came the 1960s uh, civil rights movement, and it disrupts uh, white supremacy as the rule of law. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, 
uh, our grandmothers and grandfathers civil rights movement uh, struck one of the most significant blows against white supremacy. Uh, not that it made it go away, uh, but it opened up space for other competing lenses, multiculturalism, right? Multiracialism, the idea of inclusive democracy uh, became competing uh, ideas on the field. Now imagine for a second, you believe black people are inferior in every way, but you wake up one morning, right? You've just been socialized to see that. You don't have to go study. Right, it's just reinforcing. It's it's like the air you breathe, but you wake up one morning and you realize uh, uh, black people, in fact, uh, have organized and and defeated what you saw as superior. How do you come to terms to that? Do you uh, all of a sudden just say, "Well, I guess I was wrong about black people. Uh, they must be fully fledged humans after all." Not not likely. That's that's the grip of white superiority in in our society. But people needed to come up with an answer, particularly if you were a active segregationist, you believed in Jim Crow, you believed in this false pseudo idea of separate but equal. And in the answer comes the birth of white nationalism. If white supremacy is a system of discrimination, white nationalism became a movement, a social movement grounded in backlash. It no longer saw white supremacy as something worth preserving. It saw it has a lost project that should be replaced with something else. And it is that white nationalist movement uh, 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 that uh, answered their loss, not by admitting that they lost to black political power and the allyship that they built, but that they lost to a secret Jewish conspiracy. In short, right, white supremacy is a system. White nationalism is a social movement that grew out of the loss of white supremacy in this country. White nationalists, right, don't seek to take us back to the uh, days of gone with the wind, right? They seek to replace this country with an all white nation state that is free of Jews and people of color. If white supremacy is written upon the paper of anti-blackness and race in America, White nationalism uh, was written upon the paper of anti-Semitism. White nationalists convinced themselves that they didn't lose the black people, that they lost to a Jewish global conspiracy that sought to take away and destroy uh, uh, white people and, and uh, whiteness in America. It's often why today uh, the mainstreaming of uh, ideas like replacement theory, right, or white genocide or reverse racism are actually steeped within the origins of the white nationalist movement and how it understood the loss to the civil rights movement. Well, you know, when, when you were talking about the uh, genocide of Native peoples and, uh, uh, and, and gender uh, 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 discrimination and things like that. The one thing I thought you were about to say, but I just want to dive into for a minute, have to do with United States immigration policy, because that's actually something we did work together on back at Atlantic. So you had the yes. Chinese exclusion, you have you know, a history of, of kind of racist attitudes about immigration. You have the history of actually of the kind of march into a whiteness of, of, of ethnic groups that when they came here, uh, you know, from Southern Europe in particular, were not considered to be white. Um, and then, of course, the other set of issues we worked on at Atlantic, uh, which seems to me to thread through these, uh, have to do with the uh, Oh, the war on terror and the victims of the war on terror, subjects of the war on terror. I, there was a moment in Atlantic when I realized, belatedly, I suppose some would say, um, uh, that every one of the issues we dealt with were linked by by race, <laughs> that all of the, the kind of um, uh, apparently disparate issues that our U.S. human rights program focused on, immigration, policing, uh, 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 you know, the war on terror all had a common theme of kind of fear of, uh, of darker skinned uh, people, discrimination against darker skinned people. So I just wanted to ask you for a second how, how, how immigration fits into this picture. Yeah, the conversation around immigrants and, and refugees is uh, essential uh, to the conversation of white nationalism. It, it is how it has driven most of its, its momentum 
uh, in this country, uh, playing off xenophobia. And, and Gera, uh, uh, Atlantic and, and other funders, I, I think, understood uh, this well, which was in, in, the main, in the midst of conversations around uh, uh, immigrant youth and immigrant children and uh, how they should be received and, and treated in, in our society. Uh, what we all understood was uh, we weren't debating. Uh, we wanted to have a debate about policy, right? What was the best policy for our society that centered people, that brought accountability, that brought transparency? But we, we quickly realized uh, those who, not all, but many of those who were driving what we called the anti-immigrant movement weren't interested in having a conversation uh, uh, about what was best for the country and what was best for the people in this country. They were having and trying to drive a conversation around who is an American and uh, what would America look like? And it was a conversation that was uh, framed through dog whistle uh, uh, politics, right? And uh, uh, attempts to stir up, right, uh, 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 bigotry uh, towards the Latino community. Why? Uh, to go back to the white nationalist movement, we have to understand that its goal is to create an all white nation. It is uh, uh, right now in a debate around what constitutes whiteness, right? But, but that is its goal. And it saw immigration uh, as a threat. And it saw it as an opportunity, right? To have a conversation on race without ever bringing up the conversation on race. And I often tell folks, when folks say, what do you mean by that? And what I often say is, you know, if everyone just closes their eyes for a second, right? And takes a deep breath. I'm going to give you a word. And when I give you that word, uh, I want you to imagine what comes to, to mind. So, so here comes the word. If you're listening to this right now and your eyes are closed, take a deep breath and think about this following word, immigration. You know, when people hear the word immigration, they're not imagining uh, Canadians coming down from the north. Right? They're not visualizing the large uh, undocumented Irish populations that reside in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Boston. They're not thinking about the large undocumented Polish population uh, uh, in Chicago, right? A Polish population that is uh, larger uh, than the, or was for a time, larger than the population of Warsaw. Primarily what we've been conditioned and socialized to see are brown skinned people uh, coming up from the South. Usually uh, the footage is climbing a fence or, or running, even though that's not how most immigration, uh, including undocumented immigration happens to this country. What the white nationalist movement figured out through uh, 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 the John Tanton network of organizations, folks can Google that, is that they could ha have a debate on race and belonging without ever having to be crude enough to mention race. They just had to talk about immigrants and by extension, uh, Latinos. I, I also think it's important for us to understand though that these groups weren't just spreading xenophobia to spread uh, xenophobia and racism, right? The white nationalist movement isn't spreading bigotry to spread bigotry. They're using bigotry to organize power. And fundamentally, I think what we didn't understand in a large enough uh, a set of leadership was that the anti-immigrant movement was primarily an anti-Black civil rights movement uh, uh, phenomenon. What do I mean by that? We have to go back again to that period of 1960s as white supremacy, right, is losing its dominance to this Black civil rights movement. There were three critical pieces of policy that were advanced by that civil rights movement that broke the back of white supremacy. There was, and I'll let folks put up the years, but there was the Civil Rights Act, right? There was the Voting right, uh, Rights Act, but the one we often don't talk about is the uh, Immigration Act, right? That uh, uh, ended white supremacist practice in immigration laws in this country that were completely biased and, and completely unfair. Ever since then, right, this white nationalist movement has tried to build a broad-based coalition to push back on those three pieces of legislation. It's not surprising in this moment, right? That what we are witnessing 
right, is uh, uh, attacks on voting rights, right? Attacks on uh, uh, laws that seek to integrate and welcome, right, immigrants into our communities, right? And the third, right, is to, to redefine uh, uh, segregation, right, to, to redefine who belongs through attacks on uh, uh, accurate history in, in schools, right, uh, uh, resegregation of, of housing and, and the social control uh, of Black people through a really draconian and brutal uh, policing practices. Uh, what we're facing at the end of the day is a backlash, but the first uh, 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 move on that backlash was an attack on, on, on immigrants in our community. And it continues today under the guise of attacks on, on Latinos and attacks on Muslims, right? Uh, uh, as uh, refugees, right? Uh, uh, often framed as dangerous refugees to our country, even though a significant portion of the uh, American Muslim population, right? Is American born. Right. I remember very well the moment in 2007, I think it was before you got to Atlantic when the comprehensive immigration bill that had been actually backed by the Bush administration, you know, failed in Congress. And we gave some money to Atlantic to the advocates to go off and kind of plan the future. And, you know, we realized that, um, you know, a kind of a policy focused immigration, kind of a good government focus, you know, which is the way a lot of advocates wanted to, and what a lot of foundations kind of insisted on looking at it in those terms. Um, was no match for uh, the racism of the other side. If they were making the debate about race uh, in kind of trying to talk about it as if it had nothing to do with race, we were like the proverbial liberal, you know, bringing the uh, NPR tote bag to the knife fight. You know, you really have to understand what's, what's going on and you have to address it on the terms that it's being waged. Well, I want to, um, the question I want to ask you about uh, the last year or so um, since the murder of George Floyd, which has raised um, uh, the racial consciousness of many people, uh, certainly many more white people, and have been much more explicit in their naming and their understanding, not just of racism, but of anti-Blackness specifically. And you hear that term uh, used a great deal more than um, before a year, year and a half ago. So I want to understand, how do you see the need for this specific work, anti-Blackness work, at the same time as we're all often striving uh, to be, um, to use more maximally exclusive language like BIPOC, which has come into, you know, currency in the last year or two. Um, these Are these different threads? Are they the same thread? The, the, talk about the need for, um, for work around blackness as such. Yeah, I, you know, for, for me, um, I, we, we have to be careful, right? Uh, uh, the way uh, we survive white nationalism is, uh, uh, is not by uh, reestablishing, right? Being uh, uh, more identitarian forms of, of uh, subnationalism, right? Uh, so, so we have to be a, a little bit careful. And uh, I say that because uh, when we talk about anti-Blackness, I can understand how folks might see that as a retrenchment, right, by the, by the Black community. But, but it's really not, right? It, it is actually uh, uh, an antidote. So what we have to understand is we, we have a term called anti-Blackness, and it merely recognizes that in the United States, right, and I can only speak to the U.S. context, though, when I speak to folks in Brazil, South America, Africa, Asia, uh, uh, they do reflect back uh, uh, the similarities. But anti-Blackness merely denotes, right, an understanding that in the United States, race uh, is constructed on a spectrum. And on one end of the spectrum is whiteness. And on the other end of the spectrum uh, uh, is blackness. Uh, it also denotes that uh, whiteness and blackness are not a biological definition, right? There is no biological definition of race, that these are social constructions, right? That our society has put into place uh, uh, and that some people uh, suffer the consequences of that social construction, while other people benefit because that other part of the spectrum uh, 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 is denied, 
right? Equal opportunity uh, and equal access, so black folks. So we should understand primarily that the term anti-blackness is just a mere acknowledgement of how our society has constructed race. It doesn't mean other people of color uh, don't experience racism, right? Uh, it merely just denotes uh, a, a common narrative and theme that shapes most of our conversations consciously uh, and un unconsciously. BIPOC um, is, is a term that just recognizes that uh, uh, many people of color, right, experience different forms of, of racism, uh, uh, that some forms of those racism, right, discriminatory practices uh, impact us in, in similar ways. And by uh, building relationships with, with one another, uh, we are able to, to advance uh, uh, that conversation. Multiculturalism, right, is, is something even broader, right? It, it is the belief that race is not the primary way upon which we understand one another or understand our differences. And that uh, a diverse society can still manage uh, uh, and function in, in healthy ways. And, and in fact, uh, uh, in stronger ways than monocultural societies uh, are, are able to do. So those are those three terms, right? In a conversation, I should say something for those listening, right? Uh, uh, our friends over at Race Forward who do phenomenal work, right? On understanding unconscious and, and uh, unconscious bias uh, uh, relay in their trainings uh, that uh, several studies show that even saying the word racism causes anxiety, right? In not just white populations, uh, uh, but non-white populations uh, uh, as well. So uh, while this may bring some charge, I think it's important to understand anti-blackness, right? Is merely a statement about the condition of how race is constructed in America. BIPOC is an acknowledgement that there are many communities that uh, uh, suffer different forms uh, of, of racism. And the uh, third piece is that multiculturalism, right, or multiracialism is an aspiration uh, that society can be, can function in more healthy, safe, right, and vibrant ways than a monocultural society. I wanted to backtrack just a second before moving on to something else about the borders, if you will, of, of white supremacy. Yes. So um, I think that many people until fairly recently, or many people who weren't paying a lot of attention closely, uh, or many people who benefited in a way from, from various forms of white supremacy, kind of, um, if they thought about white supremacy, they thought about the Ku Klux Klan. They thought about you know, um, uh, the, the less dramatic standing in the schoolhouse door, George Wallace, and they, um, uh, they were able to kind of distance that white people, distance themselves from white supremacist culture by, by focusing on the most virulent, you know, visible historical forms of white supremacy. I think that we've, we've learned a lot in recent years, of course, about the way in which racist practices in, in, infuse our society uh, and not just the most um, you know, virulent, uh, obvious historical ones. But also more recently, I think there's been a lot of discussion. And if you go to any kind of race training, which is being you know, conducted widely these days by most organizations, you hear a lot of talk about there's a lot of thinking about white supremacy culture being much more extensive, right? It's not simply a matter of of violence. It's a matter of aspects of the culture that are said to grow out of the privileging of whiteness. And, you, you know, you, you've seen some of this stuff, but, uh, you know, perfectionist culture and, you know, sense of urgency and, you know, the privileging the written word and things like that. And I think um, I that even I, you know, found a lot of that challenging to think about it first naturally as a white man myself. Um, but as the more I've thought about it, the more I really have come to understand and reflect on some of those things as aspects of white supremacist culture. But I wonder from your point of view, as someone who deals, who's dealt in anti-racist work for a long time, including the forms of it that continue to erupt in, in violence, um, how you feel about the kind of broadening in our discourse of the, 
boundaries of what is considered white supremacist culture. Yes. I mean, when we're talking about white supremacist culture, it's it's almost uh, uh, it's it's almost hard to 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 imagine uh, uh, a guerra. It, it's almost as complicated, right, as, as conversations around free speech, which I hope we get a chance right, to, right, right, right. to talk about. Right. right. But 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 I think you raise a good point and and we should un, we should try to untangle this um, uh, a little bit. I, I think the best way to try to understand uh, white supremacist culture, right, is uh, uh, through some examples, right? And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how it plays out. Uh, uh, Citigroup, right? And, we, you know, C- Citibank, we can all probably agree, right? Citibank is not a, a, a left rabbit uh, uh, institution. Uh, in in America, uh, seeking to overthrow capitalism, right? Uh, uh, Citigroup uh, put out a study uh, a little over a year ago uh, that showed that the United States had lost um, uh, 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 somewhere around uh, $5 trillion, right? Uh, 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 Nearly a trillion dollars a year uh, because of discrimination uh, 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 against uh, African Americans in, in the United States, so so think about that, right? In a moment, right, where uh, the economy is reeling from COVID, right, at at a time where where needs are so great, our commitment uh, to white supremacist culture is so strong that we are willing to lose as a country uh, of five trillion dollars. Then Citigroup doubled down with, with a, a larger uh, study on that, that showed that basically that has been the case for uh, nearly 11 years, right? We have lost $11 trillion uh, uh, due to racism. Now, I don't know about the rest of the country, but I'm pretty sure, uh, uh, at least here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we could have used that $11 trillion, and I'm pretty sure other parts of the country could as well. I, it's all to say, that uh, we often think of white supremacist culture as something that only impacts uh, uh, people of color. But the truth is, is that it is draining the oxygen uh, from our society, right? And it is ultimately what allows the white nationalist movement uh, to launch such a successful campaign in this moment. I, I often say we should understand that white supremacist culture is largely unconscious, right? It is uh, uh, the most visceral forms, right? Are, uh, are the fact that if you have a black sounding name, right? Many studies show you're less likely to get a call back uh, for a job. You are, uh, if you sound whatever uh, is deemed as black in the society, right? You are less likely uh, uh, to get a loan, right? Online or to get online assistance. There are countless studies. So I don't have to unpack the studies for folks. Folks can look at all the studies out there on racial disparities. If you don't believe those studies, there's likely nothing Gary and I can say <laughs> to convince you that white supremacist culture exists. Uh, but it does. And it's why it's important for us to understand that at the end of the day, right, the, the white man, if we really want to understand why the white nationalist movement is so impactful and has so much momentum in our society, we first have to be brave enough to pick up the mirror and uh, take a hard look at ourselves. It is our inability to provide, right, a, a alternative to white nationalism that is really killing Americans, right? And undercutting democracy. And the desire that I think most Americans have to to move forward together. And uh, I'll leave it with another story on on white supremacist culture. I tell this story a lot and uh, it happened now, I'm gonna say maybe five years ago, Uh, there was an alt-right white nationalist uh, mobilization here uh, in Portland. And uh, of course, the white nationalists are organizers, right? So they did it outside of a music uh, event because they knew there'd be lots of people coming in and out. They did it at a time where they knew it would make the local media evening uh, uh, news cycle. 
right? They knew it would draw counter protesters who would want, to, who some would want to get into a physical confrontation. And they knew that would make good footage and that uh, mom and dad uh, uh, sitting down for dinner or their evening drink and turning on the local news would see chaos and, and smoke. Uh, you see, uh, the white nationalist movement isn't uh, 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 just attacking people of color. Right? It, it seeks to overthrow democracy. It was the city of Portland, the city government of Portland that was actually under attack. But there was this uh, uh, anti-racist activist with a camera and he caught a young uh, white nationalist who was probably trying to just catch his breath. And uh, the guy with the camera, you all know that guy with the camera, ran up and uh, uh, shoved the camera in the face of this white nationalist and started screaming at him, right? Uh, uh, he demanded to know why this white nationalist was here in Portland. You know, uh, uh, he, he said to him, didn't you know, the, you know, the mayor doesn't even want you here uh, in Portland, Oregon. And he said, you know, look at all these counter protesters. No one wants you here. And, and, and he said almost exasperated to this white nationalist, why are you here in Portland, right? And what this uh, white nationalist activist said in response, uh, uh, all of us should really hear, uh, particularly if you're from Portland, uh, but all of us should hear this. Uh, he kind of leaned back and he smiled and he said, uh, yeah, I heard we're not wanted, uh, but did you know, he said, Portland uh, is uh, a major city with a shrinking black population. And then he went on, uh, not just shrinking, uh, uh, by percentage, but shrinking by whole number. He said, uh, and then he looked at the guy and he said, so you, you're doing something uh, we could never get away with. You are actually disappearing the black population of the city. That was his response. He was calling us hypocrites because you, you see at the end of the day, our response to white nationalism has been to bring forth white supremacy, right? And uh, white supremacy is, is not an alternative that works for people of color and it doesn't work for white folks either, right? And we see that white supremacy play out in ways that continue to put the United States and its democracy in danger. We saw it on January 6th, right? Uh, with weeks, weeks of advance notice and warnings from journalists, organizations like Western State Center, Anti-Defamation League, Southern Poverty Law Center, local grassroots organizers. I mean, the warnings were coming in from everywhere that there would be an attempted coup on January 6th. Everything pointed to it. Yet, on January 6th, what did we find? Police not in riot gear. Police completely caught by surprise. Uh, police who, uh, some police officers who we know now, uh, willingly helped facilitate the entry of these insurrectionists uh, uh, into the Capitol. Over 140 law enforcement officers injured. Let me say this again, over 140 law enforcement officers injured uh, by white nationalists on that day. And what we saw ultimately, right? It was allowed to happen because in the eyes of white supremacy, armed white people who in weeks in advance said they were going to overthrow the government uh, are not seen uh, as uh, frightening or, or dangerous, right? White insurrectionists in this country are not seen as dangerous. And that's the inherent danger of the culture of white supremacy. As one of the jurors, I was at the trial of Timothy McVeigh, who uh, uh, was convicted for the bombing of the Oklahoma City bombing. Yeah. Right, uh, 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 hundreds ki killed and injured, uh, including children. Uh, one of the jurors after the conviction uh, uh, was outside and uh, I heard her say to journalists, right? Uh, I had a hard time convicting him. Uh, he reminded me of my neighbor. He reminded me of someone I would let my daughter date. And uh, the real power of white supremacist culture is that it even puts the lives of white people in danger. And that's why a significant proportion of those killed through white nationalist violence are white. 
Yeah, no, and I think it, it's an extremely important point, and I think a very valuable contribution to our thinking about this has been Heather McGee's recent book, The Sum of Us, where she talks uh, quite a great deal about the cost of racism to white people, the draining of the pool, you know, and, and things like that. So I think I think it's very important to discuss these issues in terms of, uh, of not just kind of a zero-sum situation, but the fact that uh, white people suffer uh, have greatly diminished by 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 white supremacy. Um, let me talk about something you've alluded to a couple of times. I think it's important for us to to dive into a little more deeply. How does anti-Semitism uh, fit into this picture? Uh, at times, it seems like there are tensions, you know, particularly in the left, about where the line is between legitimate criticism of the state of Israel and its human rights practices and, and bigotry against Jews. And you've been very outspoken about anti-Semitism, and you seem to see it as part of a seamless web when confronting hatred. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, I mean, anti-Semitism, right, which is uh, uh, an ideology. It's, an, it's not just a behavior, right? So it's not just a hatred of Jews. Anti-Semitism uh, centers uh, Jews in order to explain a worldview. And, and the worldview is this, right, that, that there is a conspiracy of uh, 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 Jews uh, who seek to control and uh, uh, destroy humanity, right? It places Jews as a nefarious other, uh, uh, as the, uh, uh, on the receiving end of any society's anxieties and uh, uh, conflictions. And, and uh, anti-Semitism is old. It's one of the, it, it is the oldest form, right, of, of organized ideological bigotry, except for one, right? Misogyny, the hatred of women. And uh, anti-Semitism, I've been speaking a lot about anti-Semitism because it is a real danger. It is a danger against 75, right? It, it is a uh, position to undercut 75 years, right, of civil rights struggle in this country, right? Uh, many of the folks who came before us gave their lives, both physically, emotionally, and mentally, right, to get us to the place we are today. And anti-Semitism uh, on the left uh, uh, puts us in a position where we are about to, to throw that all away. But anti-Semitism on the right is also a configuration. As I said before, anti-Semitism on the right explains uh, to the white nationalist movement and its coalition uh, uh, how it lost, right? How folks who see themselves as superior in fact, a loss. And it's often why I say, Gera, uh, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll actually just, it's pretty short, but you know, the way to think about this is anti-Semitism isn't at the core of white nationalism. It is actually the core of white nationalism. If white supremacy is written upon the paper of anti-Blackness, white nationalism, the social movement is written upon the paper of anti-Semitism. And it is so central to white nationalism that I um, am firmly convinced that Black people and other marginalized groups will never win equity in this society unless we are active in the struggle to uproot the specific form of anti-Jewish hate. Uh, amongst 21st century uh, white nationalists, right, uh, and uh, other anti-Semites across the political spectrum, Jews are cast in the same role they've always filled for anti-Semites, right? An absolute other, demons stirring a pot of lesser evils and a, a driving force behind white dispossession. It's often why you see Jewish caricatures and, Im and imagery, right, of, of Jews holding puppet strings, either over people of color, right, liberal institutions, uh, bankers, right, the, the list goes on. It's this idea of Jews as uh, puppet masters and that we as marginalized communities are, are uh, uh, merely puppets with no agency. And at the foundation of that modern day movement, right, in this modern day uh, anti-Semitism is an explicit claim uh, that Jews are a separate race. And this is where I think some of the controversy lies in, in some of my conversations. The white nationalist movement doesn't see Jews as part of the white race. Uh, they see them as something uh, other. 
And their position as white in this society, they often frame as the greatest trick that the devil ever played. And that despite and indeed because of the fact many Jews are seen as white, right? White presenting. Uh, they are placed as an enemy race that must be exposed and, and eliminated. Uh, as I talked about a little bit before, it's that invisible, it's that fantasy of invisible Jewish power that explains how black Americans, right? A race of supposed superiors, uh, inferiors could orchestrate the end of Jim Crow or how the LGBTQ community could up in traditional gender roles, or even how immigrants, right, could successfully challenge, right, economic inequality. And folks often ask me, where is the anti-Semitism uh, uh, in the white nationalist movement? And I say it's everywhere, right? When the Tree of Life shooter uh, uh, said uh, Jews were committing a genocide, right, he was using language that was intimately familiar uh, uh, with his fellow white nationalists. And, it is such rabid anti-Semitism, which is the framework upon which this entire white nationalist movement uh, uh, is framed. But here's the deal. The white nationalist movement doesn't bring anti-Semitism into our communities, right? It simply organizes the bigotry and the anti-Semitism that already exists. If white nationalists and others are able to peddle anti-Semitism, it is because we are open to receiving it, right? We've been conditioned. Uh, none of us are exempt, right? We would not walk around and say uh, some people are susceptible to racism in American society and some people aren't, right? We understand that all of us are susceptible to unconscious forms of bias, right? Even Black folks, studies show, right? Also play out unconscious bias towards other Black folks. That is the nature of a system, right? Rather than putting blame on an individual. The, I, have, I have really talked about this because uh, I'm a person, right? I'm not the first person to warn of the rising of, of white nationalism. And, you know, this year, I will get the chance to talk about some of those amazing names and, and, and moments. But here's one thing I, I, I do know. Uh, historically, right, it has been the human rights movements of countries, progressives, right, the left, who have built the moral barrier against bigotry. But how do you get a movement, a social movements, to build a moral barrier against bigotry when they to themselves can't acknowledge that that form of bias exists in a society? And that's the uh, quandary we find ourselves in right now uh, 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 with, with the left. Uh, and with the racial justice and human rights movements in this country, uh, it is resistant uh, to understanding the role that anti-Semitism plays. I could have told you three years ago, QAnon uh, uh, was based off the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, right? The, the key anti-Semitic tome uh, uh, to anti-Semitic conspiracies, right? We could have begun to unpack that but our refusal uh, uh, to address anti-Semitism because we somehow think it might shift how we understand uh, uh, human rights abuses in, in, in Israel or uh, national aspirations uh, of the Palestinians is actually killing democracy at home, right? It's a simplistic way of understanding the world. It, it's not solidarity. Uh, it's an ostrich with their head in the sand. We are in a moment right now where the democracy, the inclusive democracy we have built, right, and uh, particularly those who came before us, uh, is under threat. And anti-Semitism is the driving force. And we're just, uh, we can't respond to it unless we first acknowledge that anti-Semitism exists. And two, we spend a little bit of time understanding how anti-Semitism functions, just like we do with any other form of bigotry. I want to open up this extremely stimulating conversation to other participants. And I put this in the chat and Ricardo has, but I'd love it uh, if people um, either put a question in the chat or told me in the chat that they'd like to be called on. So while you're doing that, I have one more question that I want to talk to you about, and you alluded to it before. It has to do with the question of of hate speech. So, you know, I'm, as you yes. know, I'm a civil libertarian. I started my career in the ACLU. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about hate speech. So 
Can you talk about the connection between speech and action and whether you think the uh, somewhat anonymous, uh, anomalously expansive protections that US law has uh, for hate speech need to be reconsidered as a lot of younger activists, even within organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union uh, are calling for? Yeah, and and Gara, I, you know, we we should say uh, to give credit where credit is due, right? Uh, when I came to to Atlantic, uh, you you really uh, helped expand my understanding. You know, I I had a pretty narrow uh, uh, understanding of civil liberties and uh, the importance of civil liberties. Uh, I think I've changed a lot. I changed from my experience uh, at Atlantic. Uh, certainly being under the pressure of a white nationalist movement uh, uh, that is authoritarian has uh, really brought home the importance. Uh, but there is this debate around uh, uh, free speech and it's often mischaracterized, right? Uh, 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 Integrity First for America has bravely launched a civil trial uh, against uh, white nationalists and neo-Nazis who uh, 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 brought a reign of terror in Charlottesville uh, at their Unite the Right rally, uh, where uh, at least three people were killed, uh, uh, two police officers and uh, a crashed helicopter. And of course, uh, 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 Heather, Heyer, who was, uh, Heather Meyer, who was a, uh, a protester, uh, counter-protesting the, the white nationalist movement. She was killed by a white nationalist there. Um, you know, it was often at the time, the president at the time uh, uh, and, and others tried to frame it as a, a question of free speech. And what we know is uh, what we're really talking about first is understanding uh, there is no absolute free speech in this country, uh, not even under the First Amendment of, of the U.S. Constitution. And uh, folks are often shocked by that. Um, uh, 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 not all speech is free, my friends. And uh, you can test that out. Uh, if you don't believe me, uh, engage in some insider trading and then report it to the Federal Trade Commission and, and see what happens to you, right? Uh, uh, shout fire and cause a panic in a movie theater uh, uh, and see what the repercussions are, right? Or uh, uh, do something uh, uh, wild uh, uh, and irresponsible in a speech like calling for harm against the elected official. Right, and uh, uh, you will see the limits of free speech. The Supreme Court has set limits uh, uh, on speech because it is balanced uh, always uh, uh, with the health of society. We happen to live in a country, right, that uh, uh, leans uh, 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 more cautiously uh, towards keeping speech open. I actually think that that is good, uh, but in a white supremacist culture, Right. What gets deemed to be important protective speech is often influenced, again, by the color of the skin of who says it. Right. And uh, uh, and who it's targeted to. So within communities of, of color and other marginalized communities. Right. The uh, disparity that exists within the conversation uh, of free speech is, is very real. We, we see it in terms of. Uh, uh, how people are held accountable. I often point out, uh, I'll, I'll use Portland, but I could use New York as well. Uh, uh, let's be clear, in the marches, uh, 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 the Black Lives Matters marches that happen around Ferguson, uh, and then the, the murder of George Floyd, in both cities, right, the majority of marchers uh, were white, right? And, uh, 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 but interesting enough, in both cities, Portland and New York, uh, uh, folks who were practicing their freedom of assembly and their freedom of speech, Blacks were disproportionately arrested. Now, how is that possible, right, uh, uh, in, in New York and, and Portland, Oregon? And another example is you might say, perhaps you might think Black folks were, were more rowdy. I'm, I'm not, they weren't, but uh, uh, actually Black-led marches, uh, statistically, even in the midst of Black Lives Matter, showed themselves to have the, the least amount of violence of any type of public gatherings, right, in this country, including other demonstrations. But let's say for a second you believe Blacks are rowdy. But then uh, please note that those white and Black folks arrested on the very same charges, right, Black folks found themselves facing 
uh, heavy, heavier fines, right? Heavier bail fees, right? And, and, and heavier sentencing. Again, uh, there is the problem isn't uh, uh, the First Amendment. The, the problem is that the First Amendment is disproportionately applied uh, to white America. And then uh, black folks and other marginalized communities are draconly penalized, right? For utilizing uh, free speech. So uh, Garrett, to come back, because this is worth unpacking. I, I'm curious, you wrote a phenomenal piece in uh, The Nation about this. And I, I, I hope folks read because I think it is really a critical conversation, right? Uh, we should understand, right, that within communities of color, there is uh, 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 that form of disproportionality in terms of how the First Amendment is applied and who it's applied to is beginning to, to bear some impact. You're starting to see a rejection uh, of the First Amendment and the free speech argument. Uh, because it, it looks and is uh, uh, biased. Now, I'm a person who says uh, we should be cautious, right? Uh, we should be deeply cautious because when we do overturn rights and civil liberties uh, in this country, it is typically marginalized communities who end up paying the price, right, of the removal uh, of, of space. And at a time when uh, a protest by marginalized communities is further being criminalized, we just have to be very careful in terms of how we walk this. Uh, but it is true, not all speech is protected in this country. And I don't believe a uh, speech that calls for the genocide uh, uh, of populations uh, uh, should be protected. Uh, but that will be fought out uh, uh, yeah. in the courts. Yeah, yeah. I think the, I mean, one of the problems with uh, remedies that uh, restrict free speech is they generally give more power to state authorities, and that power is often used in ways that uh, um, its advocates did not intend. Look, we have a bunch of questions now, and as we're okay. kind of winding into the last uh, segment here, I want to make sure we we get some of them. So, and, and please forgive me, everybody, if I butcher any names. Uh, from uh, Calyris uh, Salas Ramirez, wondering if anyone has asked, or would you talk about critical race theory, uh, the attacks on that being used to block conversations about race in the schools, uh, and what organizations like FAIR and Parent Defending Organization and Place NYC are, are blocking, you know, culturally responsive, equitable education. I had wanted to ask you about this, and that is, you know, how do you see these, and there are assaults on teachers and great deal of anger at PTA meetings and so on as a consequence to teachers and principals. How do you see this in the framework Work we've been talking about. Yeah, so uh, we should understand that uh, there are a number of conspiracies, right, that are moving through our society, and they're they're activated, right. So we should understand these conspiracies that are being peddled, conspiracy theories, right, are are intentional, and the goal is to keep uh, Trump's base activated. Right, the uh, the folks who help bring Trump into office uh, 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 are the oxygen that that movement needs to, to stay alive, and so most resources and energy have gone into uh, uh, keeping that vote that base uh, uh, mobilized. Critical race theory is uh, one of those those spaces. We should be clear. Right, critical race theory is a, a legal theory. Uh, 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 that uh, doesn't actually uh, proclaim uh, significantly more than what the Supreme Court uh, uh, itself has ruled, right? A uh, conservative Supreme Court, which is uh, uh, race uh, is a factor, right? Racial discrimination, uh, racial bias uh, uh, is a factor and it has an impact on law. That, that is critical race theory. Uh, uh, for those who want to know more, uh, uh, deeper about that, I would direct them to uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the amazing thinkers around critical race theory, uh, and the African American Policy Forum. Uh, we're really uh, uh, in her, her shop where great work is being done. But, but here's what we should understand, right? Critical race theory was prime, uh, the attacks on critical race theory were an intentional uh, backlash against the, the 1619 uh, uh, 
campaign and exhibit, right? The, the attempt to bring accurate and honest reflection of history uh, into US textbooks, right? Uh, uh, it didn't seek to change history. It just sought to make it accurate. We should talk, we should document, right? That uh, uh, black people, uh, uh, it, it should be illegal to teach uh, the American constitution, right? And the language that black people were only considered three, uh, three fifths of a human being, right? Uh, it shouldn't be illegal to point at the founding documents of Jamestown uh, uh, and show, right, that, uh, uh, one of the intents was to subjugate Native people, right, and and to take their resources uh, and land, right. That's not made up documents. Those are those are how we were founded as a country, and as we, you know, and understanding that helps us move forward together. Learning from our past helps us make better decisions. Critical race theory has been under attack, right. And if I had time right now, I'd go into a presentation around. Uh, the individuals who had intentionally uh, set up critical race theory, right? They found it. They knew the very language critical race theory would, would evoke these emotions uh, from populations uh, that they began to stir up and they pumped a lot of money uh, to make a campaign. The impact has been significant, right? It has been significant on educators, it has been significant on students, and it has been as significant on elected board officials. There are students who have been physically attacked. There are school board members who have been threatened, right? Uh, there was a high school principal where uh, three individuals attempted to uh, uh, kidnap, right? Uh, uh, a high school principal and take them uh, off campus. Uh, there has been uh, uh, an incredible amount of, of violence and uh, of physical intimidation uh, that is stirred up around schools. The real danger here, though, uh, until recently, uh, was that there was no response from uh, uh, federal and state governments. They uh, uh, basically abandoned uh, uh, schools, educators, elected officials, and their unions uh, uh, on their own. And that's part of a larger phenomenon uh, that we've been seeing. So people, organizations with no historical experience at dealing with authoritarian, uh, paramilitary, right, mob violence, were now expected to try to manage uh, of these crises. And the results were really clear, right? Students who are terrified uh, uh, to be in school. Schools are already dangerous because of the easy access to weapons in our society. And now this layer uh, uh, was added. Teachers were being fired, right? Or um, being disciplined for merely teaching truth, right? In, in history. And we know elected officials who were running, you know, uh, school board members were announcing that they would no longer run for a school board, right? They wouldn't seek their seat or meetings weren't happening. A complete breakdown of democracy. Uh, Western State Center, uh, and, and unions and uh, uh, the African American Policy Forum and others uh, uh, began to really alert elected officials to this uh, uh, last spring. Uh, uh, we knew uh, that it would only continue to, to increase. And we were very heartened uh, uh, to see uh, just two weeks ago, the Department of Education and DOJ uh, issue uh, letters and directives saying very clearly right, that they would begin to seek both criminal and civil penalties for those who seek to disrupt education. Look, teachers, educators, students already have a hard enough day, right? The last thing that they need and the last thing that they deserve, right, are people seeking to bring culture wars onto their campuses. And I, tell everyone that we have to actually be very thoughtful in, in this moment. This is not a time uh, 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 to parachute into education, right? This is a time to hold those accountable, right, who seek to disrupt the days of students. And the way that we do that is to put real pressure on the Department of Justice, 
right, on state level law enforcement and leadership uh, uh, to be responsive to this moment. It is not okay to abandon educators to this type of anti-democracy and the violence that comes with it. And, you know, fortunately at the moment we have a justice department uh, that can be uh, moved in that direction. Uh, but that That's leads right. to a final question that I'll get to in a minute. Uh, I just want to say in the chat, you know, there've been a bunch of uh, comments and questions uh, that you should look about, about distinction between white supremacy and white nationalism, about healing historical ancestral trauma. Uh, but I want to uh, call on Louis Bickford, who's in the audience, who has a question about what it means to struggle for democracy, because I think it'd be nice before I turn it back over to Andy and close this, to come back to uh, to that question of democracy, which you um, have centered in the discussion we've been having today. So Louis, if you're still with us, uh, ask your question. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Hi, Eric. Hi, uh, Gary. Hey, um, uh, yeah, I mean, and earlier on, you you kind of centered exactly, as Gary just said, the, this idea of democracy. And I'm just wondering if you'd give us your thoughts about how to organize around that. I mean, it's it's so under attack. Globally, yes. and and I know you, I know you have thought about this in terms of you know, Orban, Erdogan, CC, Trump, Putin. I mean, it's it's there's a kind of sex appeal to democracy that isn't is really under attack. A lot of people feel it hasn't delivered. So I was sort of fascinated to hear that you were you were talking about that as a kind of pivotal concept, and I'm just wondering how you see that. It, obviously, part of that is voting, but the voting, all the voting rights acts are also under attack. And I assume you think of it as, as a deeper, much deeper than just voting. And some of it you've already talked about around civil liberties and other things, but what would it mean? And then the other thing, I'm actually on the board of the Civil Courage Prize, and just to kind of bring it back a little to that, what would it mean to stand up for democracy in, in, that, kind of, in that kind of way, if you have any thoughts about that too? Yeah, I think it's important to understand Right. Uh, largely in the society, uh, uh, inclusive democracy. Right. What, and what I mean is, is uh, uh, democracy that is people centered, right, accountable and transparent has largely been built uh, through the struggle of uh, black and indigenous uh, communities here. Right. Uh, it's what, uh, as John Lewis said, uh, he once said, uh, the 1960 civil rights movement uh, took democracy from an aspiration uh, uh, to a reality. And it's our generation that now needs to, to make real. Now, look, look, I didn't grow up. I, I, I grew up in a, in a uh, I spent uh, my junior high school and in, in high school uh, primarily living in a one room motel. Right. So so uh, I'm not a person uh, uh, who grew up uh, who asked for things and uh, they showed up uh, an hour later. Right. Uh, uh, sometimes it would take years. And uh, I think we have unrealistic uh, understandings uh, that are based in deep privilege uh, around how uh, things change. Right. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean, again, uh, um, it doesn't mean we have to be uh, a purist. Right. Uh, uh, it means we need to be urgent. Uh, but we also have to understand. Uh, uh, that the God complex, the idea that we are going to deliver everything that society needs uh, for equality uh, uh, is just an arrogant position, right? It's, it's, it's godlike and, it, and it's not grounded in fantasy, in reality. Look, change takes real struggle. It takes real time. There is forward movement and there is always backlash. Can we continue to move forward? Yes but it means preserving the practice of democracy and democracy at the, at the end of the day, right? Means people power, right? It's, it's power, that's what the, the entire uh, concept, right? Of, of demos or, or democracy means, it's, it's, it's the power of the people. And what that means uh, primarily is always looking for ways to open up participation, right? Whether we're talking about governance or whether we're talking about our community or, or social movements, it means uh, uh, always expanding who gets to be part of the community because that is ultimately what makes democracy strong. It's a belief in people even more than a belief in power. 
And so I, I think moving forward, I would say this, recognize, right, that primarily the debate in this country is not one over class status, right? But who gets to be an American and what does America look like, right? So it's not primarily an economic debate, right? It's a debate around belonging, right, and, and meaning. And that is largely defined around race in our society. So we have to keep the pressure on dismantling racial discriminatory practices. So number one, the first thing we do is we triple down on segregation in our society, right? Whether we're talking about segregation in housing, in transportation, in education and employment, look, local governments, state governments, federal government, it is time to stand up and end segregation. Right? Until we dismantle segregation, that white nationalist sitting at, outside that rally right, in Portland, Oregon, is always going to be right, right. And we are always going to be seen as hypocrites. And so it's time right, to move urgently on desegregation. Second, it's time I, you to- You have a numbered list, Derek. I just want to know how many numbers yeah, you have. Just three. Just three. Okay. Okay. That's right. We're, <laughs> so the second one, you have to defend the vote right, and access to the vote uh, 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 in this moment, it is uh, uh, critical. And the third is to all of those who engage in the practice of responding to hate violence and hate groups and, and uh, 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 hate organizing, right, it is time to move from a sector to a movement, a movement that is grounded in the idea, right, that participatory democracy and representative democracy uh, is largely existent right now because those who struggled before us made it possible. It is one of the most radical ideologies that has continued to advance, right? The rights of not just black folks, right? But everyone in this society. And uh, it is time to stand up and defend democracy uh, from these groups. And so we need to mobilize and we need to let our elected officials know Right, that this is a priority. Those are the three things we can do in this moment. No, uh, I think you're very right to um, to link uh, racial justice and democracy as you have throughout, because we didn't really have a democracy when only property owners could vote. We didn't have a democracy uh, when uh, uh, black people were counted as three fifths of a human. We didn't have a democracy when women couldn't vote. And we you know, will not have or keep a democracy uh, if we don't uh, deal with the issues we've been talking about today and the ways in which um, uh, we're sliding back in the ways in which violence and intimidation, discrimination impairs the right of people to participate in democracy. So I thank you very much for the work you're doing. Uh, I'm grateful, we're all grateful to the Civil Courage Prize for recognizing that work uh, and to you for spending the last almost hour and a half in giving us this master class today. So thank you, Eric. Uh, Thank and you, congratulations, Karen. and we look forward to seeing you get the award in whatever form that is, a medal, a plaque, uh, uh, on Friday. Um, sorry we didn't get to get a couple of the questions, but um, I'm going to hand it back over to Dean Rich to close us out here. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you very much. Um, Gara, thank you. Eric, thank you so much. This was an extraordinary discussion, and thank you for your work. My, you know, my only regret is uh, when we first started planning this, we had a a plan to be together here in Harlem at City College's campus. We would then get to go to, to dinner after this. And instead, Eric is on the West Coast, Gare is in Connecticut, I'm, in, I'm, I'm at City College. Um, and there's so many questions I wanna ask and I know others, others would too. So we, we hope Eric in the future, we can welcome you to our campus physically, both so you can see this place and meet these people, but also so we can spend time um, uh, learning more from you. Um, thank everybody for, for joining us today. I, I'm reminded, I have to say something just uh, you know, it, it was less than a month ago, the last time we had a public event, the public event was with General Colin Powell. And uh, we're at the Colin Powell School and it was less than a month ago and it was only last week that he passed away. So as I sit on the Zoom I, I am and, and hear this conversation, I am thinking of him. And, um, and I just wanted to, to tell you how proud he was of this school and how proud he would have been of this conversation, that these are exactly the conversations and exactly the work this school should be a part of. We're not spectators to this, we're very much a part of it. So thank you for your leadership, Eric. Again, congratulations on the Civil Courage Prize. Gara, thank you again and thank everybody for joining us today. Have a good evening.
Thank you.